and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Hello and a big welcome to The Spectrum Show's anniversary special. I'd like to say a big thank you to all the viewers who have watched, liked and commented on the show. It really does make a big difference. So what do we have in this special episode? We look back at the show and find out my favourite moments. I take you through my top 10 favourite games. I review some games that I just can't play. And I let you laugh at my crap basic games from the early 80s. And finally, we have a game load speed test across multiple hardware devices. The Spectrum Show started in April 2012 with the very first episode. It wasn't actually an episode at all, it was just something I did to brush up my video editing skills for a job I had to do at work. I initially wanted to produce a monthly PDF magazine, but decided to try a video show instead. The show was well received, and here we are two years later. So what have I been doing to celebrate this anniversary? Not very much really. I bought a new microphone to improve sound quality, I've taken the week off work, had a rest, drank lots of wine and played lots of games on real hardware. Looking back over the episodes, I think I enjoyed the hardware features the most. I really love setting things up, trying things out and doing all the video work for it. I learnt quite a bit too about various pieces of hardware, as well as going on wild spending sprees, which wasn't so good. The Interface 2 feature was probably the most expensive. The interface I got cheap as part of a deal with four other bits of hardware that are still sat waiting to be reviewed. The cartridges though, as most Spectrum fans will know, are really expensive. And at the time I noticed two on eBay at low prices and they were sort of mislisted. Both of them ended at the same time and not wanting to miss out I put a bid on both of them, fully expecting to be outbid. What I didn't expect was that nobody else would bid on them and I'd win both of them, which is exactly what happened. Oh well, at least I did end up with two games on cartridge. The wafer drive feature from episode 2 was also good. I got the device from a friend free of charge who was having a clear out, and it was great to see an old piece of kit still working even if it did snap every other cartridge I put into it. Luckily I was recording every step, just in case something like that happened. You never know with 30 year old hardware. Another enjoyable moment was when I got my plus three. That was a whole month wasted, just loading games and creating my own discs. I had to fit the show in somehow and I've no idea how I did it. As regular viewers will know, I have my Plus 3 permanently set up at the side of my PC, so I can fire it up any time I want. The arcade clone shootouts are always well received, but were really awful to put together. Not only did I have to search for the actual games themselves, which were not often listed as arcade clones, but I also had to play them, and let's be honest, some of them were rubbish, and it was all very time consuming. But I think my proudest moment was when I actually got past level 1 of CTEC's Crazy Kong, whilst recording as well. What a moment, after 30 years I finally got to level 2. It's a pity the game is bugged and you can never get to level 3. But you never know, somebody somewhere may take their time out to try and find out if the game really has got a level 3, and whether or not we can see it. people have asked me what my top 10 Spectrum games are, and to be honest it's really difficult to pin them down. There are so many classic, iconic and brilliant games out there. I've tried to think of the games that I would gladly play right now without thinking or pausing and spend over an hour playing. There are thousands of games I've not even played yet, so I can't really judge everything, but the games here I can definitely say are the favourites out of the ones I've played so far. 
you'll notice that they're all earlier games, from the time I actually bought them, brought them home and eagerly loaded them into my spectrum. That's not to say I dislike newer games, but these represent not only playability, but nostalgia as well. So at the time of this feature, my top 10 games are, at number 10, Cyclone by Vortex Software released in 1985. This lovely looking 3D rescue game sets a nice pace and gives you plenty of time to think ahead. Not only do you have to rescue people and grab the crates, but you have to keep an eye on your fuel and of course the ever moving cyclone itself. There's a lot going on, but the game stands up well, and it's a game I can happily load and play for a long time. Controls are nice once you've learnt the keys, and it's easy to get engrossed in this. At number 9, Bruce Lee released by US Gold in 1984. I like this game mainly because I can play it, and I can progress without dying every 5 seconds. It's easy to pick up, and the screens offer a good variety of challenges including swords and waterfalls, and of course the ever-present chasing ninjas and fat men. I was never really good at playing platform games, I could just about get to level 5 on Manic Miner if I tried really hard, nor was I any good at beat em ups, so when this game came along that had a mixture of both, I was surprised to find out I really liked it. At number 8, we have 3D Star Strike from Real Time Software in 1984. The Star Wars machine was in the arcades and home users were screaming out for a conversion. Sadly, licensing, programming skills and CPU speed were real barriers, but Real Time gave us a cunningly renamed version that ticked all the boxes. All the main scenes are included with enough difference to keep the lawyers away, but at the same time giving the players what they wanted. Lovely fast vector graphics and brilliant gameplay meant that this game was a firm favourite of mine. Plus, as a bonus, it's one of the games I can complete. At number 7 is Chucky Egg from ANF Software, released in 1984. For platform games, as previously mentioned, Manic Miner could keep me happy up to about level 5 but I got bored of replaying the same levels over and over again. Chucky Egg was different, and just enough to steal the slot from Matthew Smith's classic. It didn't have the music or the sense of humour of that game, but it did have bags of playability, giving the player multiple options and paths for each level. This is another game where pace is important, it's not too rushed, and it's not too slow, and you do get time to plan your route. At number 6 is Fred from Quicksilver, released in 1984. I have reviewed this game on a previous episode, and it's a game I can pick up and play at any time. Another slow paced romp, with the difficulty setting just right. Wandering about the pyramid looking for the entrance never gets frustrating, because you always know it's going to be at the top, and it's just a process of eliminating the dead ends at your own pace. The scrolling is a bit flickery, but I still rate this game very highly. And now on to the top 5, and at number 5, Maziacs from DK Tronics, released in 1983. I had been a huge fan of the ZX81 game Mazogs and when the same author released a version for the Spectrum, I was one of the first in the queue. The Spectrum version is obviously improved, with better graphics, better sound, and better animation. The gameplay offers you help in the form of prisoners that who show you the way, and a map view so you can see what's just around the corner. The strategy element is also good. Do you take a risk and fight one of the Maziacs without a sword and low health, or do you waste time and possibly run into more dangers looking for a sword and something to eat? Another game I've completed, but I keep going back to it. At number 4, Ant Attack from Quicksilver, released in 1983. When this game came out it was amazing, and it still looks good today. Rescue your partner, which can be a boy or a girl, and run around the brilliant architecture, avoiding ants. You can of course throw grenades at them too, or use them to jump over walls. 
Once you know the layout of the city, it becomes even better, and you quickly get immersed into Sandy White's world. Nothing beats the thrill of charging around the city, with your partner in tow being chased by a pack of angry ants. At number 3 is Splat, from Incentive Software released in 1983. A unique game where the maze moves around you, and provides you with enough room and time to constantly make mistakes. You want to get straight back in, trying to beat the game, trying not to take the bait and be greedy, but somehow you always get sucked in. Running around eating grass may not sound fun, but it's exactly what this game is. Number 2 is Death Chase from Micromega, released in 1983. What can I really say about this game? It throws you into the speeder bike scene from Return of the Jedi, and gives you heart-stopping moments as you hurtle through ever denser forest. At times you are scared to blink, flicking the controls on instinct and bobbing your head from side to side as the trees whiz past, all the time searching for that perfect angle to blast those riders. On and on, deeper and deeper, tree after tree, truly a classic. Now on to the top spot, and anyone who's watched the show will know what this game is already. My favourite game is Jetpack, from Ultimate Play the Game, released in 1983. For me, this is just spectrum perfection. It has everything an arcade game should have. Different levels, different aliens, lots of blasting, spaceships to build, and even a bug that allows you to rest every fourth level. I never got through all the levels, and I think the closest I ever got was in the late 80s, when I managed to get to ship number 3. Since then I've been trying to improve on that, never quite managing it, but I still never get tired of trying. So I guess there was no real surprises in there, but you may have noticed a lack of isometric 3D games like Night Law, Batman or Head Over Heels. I don't know what it was, but I could never play these games. Yes, they look stunning, and when you watched other people playing them, they made it look easy. Yet I still struggle to get further than a few rooms in any of the ones I've tried. There are also other notable games missing, for example Jet Set Willy, for me a poor second to Manic Miner that only just missed out getting into my top 10. Highway Encounter, another great game, but I can only play that for about 5 or 10 minutes. Phoenix from Mega Dodo Software, a great shooter, as is Beam Rider from Activision. Thruster from Software Projects, Timegate from Quicksilver, the list goes on and on. And as I've said, it was really difficult to pin down 10 titles. As for modern games, of the ones I've played, there are maybe 2 or 3 that could have made it onto the list. The first is Dung Darek. A brilliant game with bags of playability and great graphics. When I reviewed this game, I played it for ages. It's a really great modern game that came very close to being in my list. Then there's Sergeant Helmet, another great game with superb graphics and brilliant gameplay. Not forgetting Genesis or King's Valley, all of which could have made the list. Well, that was my top 10 Spectrum games. And now onto something less appealing. When I first got my Spectrum in early 1983, one of the first things I did was to type out games that were in the numerous magazines like Sinclair User and Popular Computing Weekly. This ultimately led to me trying to write my own games. Initial efforts were terrible, and I quickly settled into text adventures, mainly to avoid clumsy graphic routines. The first few were, again, terrible, not even having a saved game or object collection. The first full game, although you still couldn't save your progress, was Spirit of Death, wrote in February 1984. You may recall from the Spectrum Show Annual that this game was sent to CRL, and the outcome of that little episode can be read in those pages. Graphic adventures soon followed, and the parsers got better, allowing objects to be collected and dropped, and even very basic character interaction. Embarrassingly, I made cassette inlays for them too.
This game, called Bounty, written in October 1984, was later rewritten and released as a text-only game in 2012. More adventures followed until August 1986, when I wrote my first arcade adventure. Tomb was obviously inspired by Attic Attack, and the aim is to control a small droid looking for lost treasures in ancient tombs. A few more text adventures followed before Gwot came along in December 1986. Here you had to remotely control a robot and guide it safely out of the enemy base. It's all in basic, but hey, I was learning. After a few more adventures came Craft. You would just crashed on an alien world and you had to wander about collecting pieces of your spaceship so that you could escape. Each room reduced your energy, so making a map was important. The game looked nice and I was quite proud of this one. Next came Cubix. This is the game that I wrote for a local bulletin board system called Phantom BBS. It's a kind of reverse Cubic game where you have to chase all the balls. Big graphics were the order of the day for my next game called Countdown. You had to wander about a multi-leveled base looking for the mechanism to avoid a nuclear explosion. Each floor had doors that needed keys to get through and all in a set time limit. This takes us up to about 1987, and at this point I still wrote games, but far fewer, as my attentions were drawn to the 16-bit machines. I wrote a bomb avoidance game called Ducks in 1988. I wrote Baldy, a Spectrum version of my Amiga game, also in 1988. Well, that's a quick look at my crap basic games. You can all stop laughing now, and I suppose we all have skeletons in our cupboard from our early days. Let's move on quickly. As each show progresses, the game review section is the one that I have mixed feelings about. There are times when I genuinely look forward to playing the game, and there are times when I'm surprised by a game I had not previously played. And of course there are the times when I play a game and think, what the hell am I wasting my time with this for? Some of these games never get past the first few minutes of play before I go looking for something else. The reasons are mainly playability. If you continually die after a few seconds over and over again without any sort of learning curve, then for me it's not worth the effort. For this segment though, I'm going to get out a few of those games again to see if they really are that bad. Or is it the fact that I'm just rubbish at playing that particular game? Our first game, Oriental Hero, was originally planned for Episode 7. The game, released by Firebird Software in 1987, sees a mysterious newcomer arriving to Outer Mongolia to challenge for the title of Supreme Oriental Combat Master. To win, he has to fight his way through four areas, killing everything he meets. Ok, so what we have here then is a left to right moving beat em up. The intro music is a bit odd, with thumping sounds that crop up in a poorly put together beeper tune. On with the game then and level 1, the Cobra. Our hero is portrayed with nice graphics, but, ah, he got killed. What the hell was that? Let's try again, ok. Man from behind, nice. Again, dead. I'm sure I hit that fella. Come on. Dead. Dead. Another try. Maybe I need more practice. Oh, I managed to hit something. Dead. And you can see why it never really made the show. This is just so frustrating. 
the graphics are okay, sound is a bit poor, with just a walking sound, well at least I think it's a walking sound, and the sound when you inevitably get the chance to hit something, or get killed, which in my case happens quite a lot. Dead again. I don't even think there's any skill involved in this game, it's just a matter of timing things right. But for me that just doesn't make it the total sum of the game. There should be more. Dead again. Ah, I certainly won't be playing this again. Let's move on to our second game, and it's Super Stuntman from Codemasters, released in 1989. Here you play a super stuntman, who must take part in seven scenes from an action movie. Crashing does not damage you, and crashing into other riders or vehicles scores points. However, you have to watch out for fire, and cannonballs, because they will destroy you. So after a nice tune, it's on to scene one, a car chase through a desert. The game is nice, well drawn graphics, and it's easy to see what's going on. What isn't so easy though, is controlling the car. The rocks are easily hit when you skid them out like crazy, and no matter how much you try and control it, it just seems to make it worse. You can shoot the other cars, if you ever actually manage to line them up. Sound is good and control is responsive, I suppose, but the whole mechanics of the car handling lets the game down. If there is good action, and by that I mean you get burnt in fire, then the game stops and tells you so. Not really a good way to keep the pace going. Back to the game and again, the time is just against me and I continually hit the rocks and skid about, often getting blocked in. So frustrating. The game really, when you strip everything away, is a memory test of which route to take through the game. But it could have been so much better. I don't know how long I can keep playing this and dying. I never got to see the other screens, which is a pity because I paid for this game that boasted seven scenes, and because of poor mechanics I'm only allowed to play the first one. Can I have my six seventh of my money back, please? On to our next game, and it's Caves of Doom from Mastertronic, released in 1985. Here we play an astronaut, captured and imprisoned in the Caves of Doom. To escape, you have to find five keys. The premise is simple enough. Walk or fly through the maze, collect fuel pods, and look for keys, and try not to get killed. So why can't I play it? Well, mainly because of this screen, among several others. You just have to be so precise that I end up being killed over and over again. And if and when I do get through, I find myself being chased and having no time to find an exit. Then there are places where, again, you have to be so precise. One pixel wrong and it's curtains. The frustration level in this game made me quickly put it aside. Even now, playing it again for this review generates the same rage it did the first time. The game is just too ruthless and the speed of the main character means mistakes are easily made. The graphics and animation are okay I suppose, the sound is adequate, and the idea, although not original, is possible. It's just the gameplay where it falls flat. I'll have to stop playing it now, I really will, before I burn the tape and dance around stomping on it. Time to calm down and move on. Our next game may be a surprise to you, it's Hundra from Mastertronic. This merely made it into the show. It has great graphics, really well drawn and smooth, nice control, a good plot and plenty of exploration. Sadly though, there are problems, at least for me. There are traps in certain areas that, because of a bad jump, means you end up getting stuck. Once you remember how to avoid this, then there's a river, or a lake, with rocks that you have to jump across. This is tricky, it's a place where I very rarely get past. So this, for me, is about as far as I ever get, at least until this review. I gave this game a fair chance and played it maybe 10 or 12 times, always getting killed at the same place. But when I finally did make it across, after a lot of swearing, I found another problem in that there's a certain location that if you make one wrong jump you can't pick an item up and you have to go all the way back round again, getting killed. Those little flying things really drain your energy and there are too many to make the game playable. There isn't a single screen where they don't appear and reduce your energy and there's no way to take a break. Yes, there are things lying about that you can collect that give you health, but these are few and far between. 
and all this means that I gave up after I had enough footage. It's a pity, the game looks really nice. Maybe it's just that I'm a bad player. The game just didn't draw me in. It was just a case of running around waiting to be killed again. To improve this game all you had to do was remove the flying things, or at least reduce them, or not have them on every screen. Add some puzzles and this could have been a great game. Watching the RZX playback, it seems the game map isn't so big. So maybe they cranked up the difficulty so that it wouldn't be completed easily. Anyway, for me, it's just a case of nice graphics, shame about the gameplay. Having done several features previously about storage systems, I wondered how loading times would vary across them all. So yes, it's time for a race. Obviously, to make things fair, I would have to use the same game, but for technical reasons the actual code format could not be the same. So, for this feature we're going to compare the loading time of Bugbytes, Birds and the Bees. Let's introduce the main competitors. We have normal tape loading on a real spectrum, we have the wafer drive featured in episode 2, we have the micro drive featured in episode 27, we have the plus 3 disc that is featured in episode 14, the Div IDE, featured in episode 23, and Otla, the turbo loader, a great application featured in episode 26. It's obvious which the slowest will be, the original tape loader, which began loading at the beginning of this feature. But what about the rest of them? Well, having dug out all the old video footage, and made new footage of the stuff I've either lost or wasn't filmed properly, I'm going to set them all up on screen at the same time and synchronise the ending, so they will all finish at exactly the same time. So here we are, the normal tape still loading. Next we have the wafer drive. Sorry about the movement in the video. This is the only footage I've got of the working wafer drive. During the review, it chewed up most of my wafers, meaning that I didn't want to risk plugging it all back in again. However, it soon settles down and we can carry on. Next we have a cluster of three, all pretty close speed-wise, and they are the ZX Micro Drive, the Plus 3 Disc, and the Turbo Loader Otla. And finally we have the Div IDE. And the game is about to finish loading on all formats. For your sanity, I have only put one audio track on. The slowest is obviously the tape, finishing in 2 minutes 41 seconds, if it ever gets there. Next we have the wafer drive, poor performance here by the Rotronic system, only managing 60 seconds. Next comes Otla at 19.1 seconds, not bad for a software turbo loader. Then Sinclair's micro drive with a respectable 17.1 seconds, closely followed by Amstrad's plus 3 drive at 14.1. But the overall winner? just had to be the Div IDE, with a blinding 4.3 seconds. For more details of these devices, check out previous episodes. Well, that was a bit of fun to end this Spectrum Show anniversary special. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next episode.